Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In holy baptism, Robert was clothed with the robe of Christ's righteousness that covered all his sin. St. Paul says, together, Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. Please be seated. Robert Bob Julius Schlender was born October 28, 1930 on the Schlender homestead near Tigerton, Wisconsin to the late Frederick and Almer Beisdorf Schlender. He was born again in the waters of holy baptism on Thanksgiving Day, November 27, 1930 at Peace Lutheran Church in Split Rock, Wisconsin by Reverend H.J. Breed. He confirmed his faith to Reverend Paul Murray Wall at Emmanuel Lutheran Church, Tigerton, on June 3, 1945. His confirmation verse was 
2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Bob graduated from Tigerton High School in 1949. He served in the United States Army from October 1951 until 1953 during the Korean War and was in the Army Reserves until receiving an honorable discharge in 1959. On May 4, 1957, Bob was united in marriage to Sharon Burmeister at St. Paul Lutheran Church in Bondwell by Reverend Randolph Miller. He worked at Badger Breeders, Appleton Coated Paper, and Aid Association for Lutherans, AAL, where he spent the majority of his career as a field rep, retiring in October of 1991. Bob served as an elder of Zion Lutheran Church in Wayside, was influential in starting NEW Lutheran High School in Green Bay, and was president of the Wayside Morrison Lions Club. In his free time, he enjoyed bowling, pitching for slow pitch softball, playing cribbage, drawing, and golfing. Bob is survived by his wife of almost 67 years, Sharon, their children, Robert and Sandy Schlender of Green Bay, Anne and Gerald Ferdon of Laramore, North Dakota, and Scott and Donna Schlender of Green Bay, son-in-law Philip Fackhelm, 13 grandchildren and 23 great-grandchildren. He is further survived by his siblings, Genevieve Buck, Gordon and Agnes, Agnes Schlender, Rosalind and Jane Schultz, and Gary and Sandra Schlender, sister-in-law Joanne Shear, brother-in-law Gerald Brown, and many nieces, nephews, other relatives, and friends. He was preceded in death by his daughter, Amy Goltz Fackhelm, and son, John Schlender, his parents, parents-in-law, Norman and Esther Burmeister, two siblings and their spouses, two sisters-in-law, and two brothers-in-law. Bob, Bob entered his heavenly home on Saturday, April 15th, 2023, having attained the age of 92 years, five months, and 18 days. If you are able, I invite you to stand with me and we pray responsively, Psalm 130. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord Let your ears be attentive to the, to the voice of my pleas for mercy. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, but with you there is forgiveness, I wait for the Lord, my soul waits. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchmen for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord. And he will redeem Israel. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. O God of grace and mercy, we remember before you our brother Robert. We thank you for giving him to us to know and to love as a companion in our pilgrimage on earth. In your boundless compassion, console us who mourn. Give us your aid, so we may see in death the gate of eternal life, that we may continue our course on earth in confidence until by your call we are reunited with those who have gone before us. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please be seated. Our first reading this morning is from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Paul writes, Now I would remind you, brothers, 
of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins, in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I would say a fair number of times uh, I select 1 Peter 1, 3 to 9 for a funeral, in part because it's uh, a very favorite portion of scripture for me, but especially verse 4 I like. I'm going to read that right now, then we'll read the whole thing. Uh, Christ says we've we've received this gift, and what is it, verse 4? An inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. This is the ESV translation. NIV says that the inheritance will never perish, spoil, or fade. And you don't have anything else like that in life that will never perish, spoil, or fade. But that's what we have in Christ. We call it salvation. So this is uh, Peter near the beginning of his first letter. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Once more, I invite you to stand, if you are able, for the reading of the Holy Gospel, followed by our confession of faith. The Holy Gospel is according to St. John, the sixth chapter. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. This is the gospel of the Lord. Together we confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. He rose again ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. 
From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
dear friends in Christ Jesus, all of his grace and mercy and peace be unto you. Right in the middle of Easter season, with the lilies starting to fade, but the cross stands, the tomb is empty. And these words from Paul, I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received. That's our text. We'll expound on it as we go. I remember when my grandpa died in East Troy, Wisconsin, where he spent, I think, his entire life. And the pastor rehearsed the things that grandpa was known for. The pastor said, Fred loved dart ball. He enjoyed watching the Cubs, even though he was in Wisconsin. He was a great Cubs fan, not a Brewers fan. He was a snowbird. He went on through the things. Kind of like I want to say about Bob. He loved playing cribbage. I never played because uh, I was never any good at it, 15-2 and whatever it is, and I don't know what all those numbers mean. And, but he liked it like playing softball, had a sweet tooth. I talked to somebody from our congregation, uh, don't remember if, when it was, after Bob died, but not this morning. And he said, oh yeah, I remember Bob from uh, you know, years ago, and he was always kind of go-lucky and loved to tell a story and usually had a joke. And I'm thinking, well, I can vouch for that. I'm sure every pastor that visited him, you don't really get started before Bob has a little story or a joke to tell. And um, I don't remember any of them, so I don't know if that indicates how funny they were or not. But uh, they kind of made you laugh at the, at the time. So we can go through these things about Bob, and we should. God used him to be dad, to be grandpa, husband, employee, citizen, church member. I didn't know he even helped start N.E.W. Lutheran. He did these things and enjoyed them. But back at my grandpa's funeral sermon, after the pastor spent a few moments talking about Fred, my grandpa, then he tacked on, but you know, Fred was also a sinner. Now, I don't remember if I was in college or seminary at the time. I do remember my dad saying to me afterwards, well, I thought he came on a little strong, meaning the pastor, with the sinner part. And my dad said, you know, we all got faults. I don't know why he needed to kind of mention that the way he did. I knew why. Because Paul said, I am giving to you what is of first importance, not seventh, not 23rd, not number two. I am giving to you what is of first importance, and it's not one thing, it's a collection of things. That Christ died for our sins, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, that he appeared to Cephas, then to the 12, then he appeared to more than 500, and the list continues. I don't remember if I tried to explain to my dad how the pastor was trained to think. Jesus comes to give to us what is of first, of, of, of first importance. I don't think I knew till this morning that a young man named Daniel died only a couple years ago. Grandson son of one of Sharon's daughters. Until this week, I had forgotten that Bob and Sharon lost a little boy when he was three. I can't imagine. I met Big Tall Tim a few minutes ago. It's a nice name, isn't it? it happens to be my name, too, in case you didn't know. 
got a tattoo on his arm about the size of a softball, maybe bigger. That's different than our generation. Marking his mom and her passing a couple years ago. That pastor for my grandpa's funeral knew what Paul teaches us. I delivered to you as of first importance. Doesn't much matter if you get to be 92 or 101 by some small miracle, or if through the pain it causes, he takes you off this earth when you're only three. We need what's of first importance. Life goes by quickly, and it doesn't take long before years turn into decades. And then it's your turn. Maybe you'll see it coming. Maybe it just happens in your sleep. I delivered to you as of first importance. Christ died for our sins. I'd like to spend a couple moments on that. Two or three different, I guess, little stories or illustrations I'd like to use. Isn't it something how most of us think our sins aren't all that significant? It's a faith thing that we believe in something called the sinful nature. I never met anybody as a pastor. I guess there's, I hate to say never, that really thought they were all that great of a sinner, that their sins amounted to much. And do you know why that is? Because I think what we do is compare ourselves to one another. So here's how this sort of works. Here's my first little illustration. We sort of tend to think, most of us, that if the difference between us as people is kind of like standing on steps, and the higher the step, the closer you are to Jesus, that you might see yourself or I might see myself standing on, say, step three. I'm not on the ground floor. Ground floor, first step, oh, that's for people that they did something kind of bad. You know, they embezzled from the place they worked at or, you know, pick some sort of sin that I never did that. Yeah, I've got my sins, but I never did something like that. Or the guy that always cheated on his tests in school or whatever it is. And so we compare. And we sort of act like the staircase goes up about eight steps. So if I can slot myself on step three, four, or five, and somebody's down there on step one, I'm pretty good. But you see, if you want to use the staircase for comparing, you have to think of it this way. Did you know, and it still might be visible, that a few weeks ago for, I think, two, three um, months, I don't remember when it started, maybe in the winter, that you could see Jupiter in the night sky. Did you know that? And maybe it's still visible. And then one of the other planets was kind of right below it. If you looked at the uh, western sky at about dusk for two, three hours, and the brightest star wasn't a star, it was a planet, and if I'm not mistaken, it was Jupiter. Just glowing out there. It's kind of impressive. Now back to the staircase. We compare our sins to each other. So yours are worse than mine, or mine are worse than somebody else's, or whatever. But you see, you've got to think of it as the staircase going to Jupiter. And the distance between here on step two. And how many steps does it take to get all the way up to Jupiter? I have no idea how many light years away that is. That's where Jesus' perfection and holiness is. You want to start talking about the sins that you have and how this compares? 
Well, let's compare it to somebody who is pure and holy and unselfish and always giving and willing to sacrifice, something we can't even comprehend. It's why it's of first importance that Jesus died for our sins. Here's another way to get at this. And again, this is, this is not a downer. This is a good thing. God loved talking about sins. Why? Because he buried them, took care of them all. He liked talking about sin. Why? Because it has the power to put you in hell, but not when Christ is on this earth, not when he is sacrificed, not when he comes out of the tomb. I told Scott, I asked him a little bit ago, Scott, how old are you? He says, 56. I said, okay, you got to trust me. I'm going to pick on you in the sermon. He says, smiles. He didn't even look too nervous. This is an illustration. Where is he? There he is. This is an illustration we use during Lent, and I don't want to use it uh, this morning because it got a lot of feedback. People text out, Pastor, that was really good. So here's the story about sin also. On that week in midweek during Lenten services, we were talking about the judgment seat of Pilate and the judgment seat being able to witness the number of people that came forward and Pilate being the judge of how guilty they were or not, whether they'd get the death sentence or not. So this is how this works before God, speaking again about our sin, and there's not one of us here that really thinks we're all that bad. It's hardwired into us. A sinful nature never thinks it's that bad. Even our little sins, we think, don't add up to that much. So I said, Scott, how old are you? And he said, 56. And I said, perfect. So here's the thing. If Scott were here during the midweek Lenten service and stood before the judgment seat and was asked, Scott, how many sins do you commit in the average day? Scott doesn't say anything. And if I were leading the little program, I would say, well, how about if we use the number three? And Scott would say, you mean three sins a day? I said, yeah, how about that? Just, just three sins a day. A little sigh of relief, and he'd say, oh, okay, yeah, let's go with three. That doesn't sound too bad. Does that sound too bad? Three sins a day? I mean, I got those used up before I put coffee or cream in my coffee. Three sins a day. Thought, word, deed, three. All right, Scott, three sins a day times seven days a week is 21. We'll round it down to 20 for nice, easy arithmetic. Times about 50 weeks a year puts you at 1,000 sins a year at the rate of three a day. How old did you say you were? Oh, 56. 56,000 sins at the rate of three a day. But then the judge looks at Jesus, goes through the drill again. No, I haven't committed any sins, Jesus says. You've never committed. He's at 56,000 and you haven't committed one. That's correct. And God goes on to explain. Scott, here's what we're going to do. We're going to take your record of 56,000 sins plus the death and damnation sentence that he's earned. It's what you get for sin, you know. Big ones, little ones, all of them. We're going to take your record of 56,000 sins plus your death sentence and your damnation. I'm going to lift that right off of you, God says. I'm going to put that over on my son. All the punishment, all the sentencing puts it right on his own son. And he says, Jesus, I'm going to take your perfect record, not a spot, blemish on it. You've done nothing but honored me, loved me, served me, sacrificed yourself for people continually. What you have earned, what you deserve is salvation for yourself as a human being. You lived in such a way you actually deserve everlasting life. But I'm taking that from you, your perfect record, not a thing on it, plus the salvation that you have deserved by your life. I'm taking that from you giving that to Scott and to the rest of you. Of first importance that Christ died for your sins. But Paul doesn't stop there. See, it's a collection of things. And I'll try not to keep you here for an hour. But this is, this is as good as it gets. It's of first importance. What's the second thing Christ said? Uh, that Paul said about Christ, dies for our sins, yes, in accordance with the scriptures, meaning the Old Testament promised it was going to happen. He was buried, yes, we get that, and was raised on the third day. Now, why is that important? Because as a, if all we get is the cross and we never get to the painting on my right, your left, the empty tomb, 
If we never get to Easter Sunday, Paul doesn't get to say the first thing that our sins are forgiven. They aren't forgiven if Jesus doesn't rise. He has to rise. And now, why is this significant that he is raised from the dead? Yes, it proves that his sacrifice was accepted by God, that he did get to die for my sins, for yours, and for everyone's, that he surely did. But let's not gloss over this too quickly. And as Christians, it's easy to do. Gloss over what too quickly, that Jesus actually rose from the dead. Now, I've got to take another couple minutes. I want to tell you another story. If I told you that I have a pet elephant whose name is Tiny, would you believe me? Mm, probably not. But if I say, oh, no, really, I'm not kidding. Nancy and I love animals, and, you know, we don't only have an elephant named Tiny, we have a giraffe named Too Tall. Well, we've got a couple acres out in the country, you know, there's plenty of room for them. We've got them fenced in, it's all fine. You'd still wonder, can I really believe him? They, they don't really have an elephant, do they? And if I went on to tell you, yeah, you should come out and see Tiny and watch him put his trunk into a five-gallon pail of water, take a drink. That yeah, water level goes right down. It's kind of fun to watch him. And you'd be thinking, is he serious? Do the Shoops really have an elephant named Tiny and a giraffe named Too Tall? You might be wondering. But then if I said, and you know what? Here's the thing. T both tiny and too tall, they can fly. And then you're like, okay, that's it. That's so far over the top. Elephants don't fly and neither do giraffes. But if I told you, no, I'm, I'm, not tell I, I'm not kidding. That elephant can fly. He never gets usually more than 10 or 15 feet off the ground. And sometimes he lands kind of heavy if the wind isn't right or whatever. You'd be thinking, Pastor, where is this going? You don't have an elephant. You don't have a giraffe. And if you did, they don't fly. Where am I going? Dead people don't come out of the ground alive. You might as well tell those people at the time of Paul when he was preaching, when he says Christ was not only crucified but raised from the dead, it's of first importance. You might as well have Paul try and tell those people that elephants fly. We gloss over it. This is no small thing. Elephants don't fly. But God's Son did rise from the dead. It is not believable, not now and even more so back then. Death does not back up. They had no belief in a physical, a physical resurrection of the dead, not on the day when Jesus died and not at the end of time if they believed such a day was coming. Don't gloss over it. Rejoice in it. Thank God for it. Know that it's true. Jesus was buried. That's easy. But he actually took our sin, not easy, and came out of that tomb alive, alive to this day, still human, and we're going to see him again. And Paul isn't done. Of first importance, then he appeared. And that's the thing. That's not just frosting. It's more meat. Those apostles didn't believe. They couldn't get it in their head. They heard the prophets. They heard the women tell them. They still doubted. They hid. They didn't understand. They didn't believe. Jesus appeared to them. He appeared to Mary. He appeared to the other Mary. He appeared to Peter on Easter Sunday. He appeared to the ten apostles Easter Sunday night. Judas is gone. Thomas wasn't there. Thomas says after they run to him, I won't believe it. What are you talking about? You might as well tell me that elephants fly. Jesus is not raised. I'll never believe it unless I see his scars. And he did see his scars, didn't he? One week later, eight days later, the New Testament says, they count the day you're starting on, we start counting the next day. Sunday night, one week later, last Sunday in our time, Jesus appeared to them again in human flesh to the ten plus Thomas. Thomas, stop disbelieving. See my scars. Put your hand here. Thomas says, my Lord and my God. Thomas says, my Lord and my God. And Jesus doesn't say, no, Thomas, you can't call me God. He took that title because God is in the flesh and Jesus did come out of the tomb. 
and it cemented the faith of those apostles. John said, have you believed because you have seen? Blessed are those who believe and have not seen. Well, I'm here to tell you Bob saw the Lord every time his pastors came to their home, have a devotion in the Lord's Supper with the scripture reading. Bob heard the Lord, and so have you. We'll see the Lord face to face, and until then, we keep basking in, taking the word, the promises. Which words? The words that are of first importance. Everything that Christ did, born, lived, then suffered and died, then rose, then appeared, that's all of first importance. So that you and I can know, and Bob's family can know, that we belong to him because of Christ now and forever. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard and keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.
we stand for prayer. We pray responsively. Almighty God, you have knit your chosen people together in one communion in the mystical body of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Give to your whole church in heaven and on earth your light and your peace. Grant that all who have been baptized into Christ's death and resurrection may die to sin and rise to a newness of life, and that through the gate of death and the grave we may pass with him to our joyful resurrection. Grant to us who are still in our pilgrimage and who walk as yet by faith your Holy Spirit, that he may lead us in holiness and righteousness all our days. Grant to your faithful people pardon and peace, that we may be cleansed from all our sins and serve you with a quiet mind. Grant to all who mourn the death of their loved one, Robert, sure confidence in your loving care, that casting all their sorrow on you, they may know the consolation of your love. Give courage and faith to Robert's family and friends that they may have strength to meet the days ahead in the assurance of a holy and certain hope, in the communion of your church, and in the joyful expectation of eternal life with those they love who have departed in the faith. Help us, we pray, in the midst of things we cannot understand, to believe in and find comfort in the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting, hear us, O Lord. God of all grace, you sent your Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, to bring life and immortality to light. We give you thanks that by his death he destroyed the power of death, and by his resurrection opened the kingdom of heaven to all believers. Strengthen us in the confidence that because he lives, we shall live also, and that neither death, nor life, nor things present, nor things to come will be able to separate us from your love, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.